Hey, teacher. So today I want to talk about that podcast that came out relatively recently called Soul to Story. It's about the science of the teaching of reading. And it was an investigative report that went into all of the, like the entire history, basically, of how we came up with our reading programs in America and where we went wrong. It's very eye-opening and you should go listen to it for sure. Listen to this whole video first if you want, <laughs> then go back and listen to the entire podcast. I think it's six episodes, but it sent me down a rabbit hole because so much of it was based on how much research has there been on the science of teaching reading and who are we listening to? And then it made me think about writing and it made me think what kind of instruction is going on out there in the field of writing for kids basically from K to 12 that we can see that's actually evidence-based, that's working. So I did a bunch of research, and I was surprised what I found. There was one aha moment, and it comes at the end, so stick around for the, for the end of the video. I'm going to reveal number three of these three components of a good writing program that I found that is going to be really interesting, so stick around. Hi, I'm Robin Millam, children's book author with Disney Hyperion and HarperCollins. I'm also a middle school teacher. I teach writing and I have created my own writing program. And part of the reason why I did that is because of all the stuff that happened when I was listening to that podcast, Sold a Story, is that I just over the years had this feeling that the way that we were teaching writing, it wasn't working. And it wasn't working just on what I could see in my classroom. And then the experiences that I had going from a middle school teacher to becoming a published children's book author. And then everything that I went through with my editors that I was completely unprepared for. I'm going to go into more detail about that in another video of like all the stuff that I had to learn and relearn when I became an author that I never have been taught before. So I redid my workshop so that it's this combination of a student-led workshop that's really motivating. It, it goes back to the pure part of a workshop where their kids are tinkering and creating and all of that, but intermixed in there is direct instruction into these like really short dynamic mini lessons. And for me, that combination is working. And the reason why the Soul to Story podcast was like, whoa frustrating, I guess I'd say, is because it made it clear that over the years, we have swung on this pendulum of how we approach instruction. It's like, oh, it's not working, so we must try this. We must do whole language. We must do cueing. We must do, you know, like this whole other side of it, of the reading versus some kids need phonics. And the teachers that I've talked to through the years have been like, yeah, but they need both. And a lot of them have been doing this combination on their own, on the fly almost. Like, and they knew that's what worked. And it's frustrating when school districts or school boards or administration or whatever, they pick out this particular curriculum and say that you need to teach to this with fidelity. When we know as teachers, like it's not working because we can see the evidence right now in our classroom. So with writing, I was a little concerned that maybe we're going down that same road of, oh, we're going to swing to this pendulum and then we're going to swing to this pendulum. And honestly, I think that's what's happening. I think we have a problem. So we have gone from like this kind of old school, like when I was a kid, we did diagramming sentences until your fingers would bleed and you'd cry. Like that's how I learned all the parts of, of a sentence. And then it kind of swung to this, to the writer's workshop that was very you know, open and you kind of do what you want and you kind of sit in the corner you can turn you know do whatever you want there and then now it's back to the common core oh we need to teach these three or four essays and we need to do constructive responses and all the workshop now is like rammed inside these products of three to four essays per year and the whole thing has gotten kind of like wonky it's it, i just it's frustrating. I don't know if you guys are feeling that same way too. So I started doing some research over the holidays like a nerd. And there's not much out there. And part of the problem that I'm seeing even in the research that I'm reading 
is that it's very hard to get evidence-based research done on writing in kids in particular, because in order to do that, you have to have a control group. So you'd have to do the instruction with one group and then not do it with another and then compare them. And then when you get the results, you get their writing back and writing is very subjective. So it kind of depends on the whoever it is that's grading it. What do they deem as quality writing? It can kind of vary. So it's it's hard. And we're going to have to kind of go on our gut instinct here. And part of the reason why I did this program, I'm, I'm going to share this at the end, actually, was something that I heard Mel Robbins say. If you've never heard of Mel Robbins, she's fantastic. She's like, between Brene Brown and Mel Robbins, like, your life will be fixed. Just listen to those two women. So strong. And I, she said something on a podcast, and I think she said it directly to me <laughs> because that's how it felt. Um, and that's why... I created this program. I'm going to tell you what that was at the end. Meanwhile, here is one of the research articles that I came across. Looks like this. Printed it out like a goober over Christmas. Um, this one's called Evidence-Based Practices for Writing Instruction. And it's done by the Cedar Center, like an institute. And they actually are through the um, Department of Education, through Special Education Department. And they're through the University of Florida. So here's what I wanted to show you with this. I'm going to read you some of the things that they came up with with their evidence-based research. The only weird thing about this is that they, they give a lot of information of where they got all this research from, but it doesn't really explain, like, here's a control group. Here's what these students got. Here's what these students got. Like, you can't really see how it worked for some and how maybe it didn't work for others. So I feel like that's missing in all of this. And maybe that's not even possible. I don't, I don't know, you know. So they do a lot of uh, referencing this one person. His last name is Appleby. And he is someone who I referenced in my ebook. So we'll get to that too, of what I found from his research from a long time ago. Now, according to this institute, they came up with um, 10 essential component categories for writing instruction. I hope I'm not boring you to death right now, but like this is so interesting to me. <laughs> and some of these were like, mm -hmm. um, and then some are like, okay, well, that's interesting. But then there's another article I'm going to share with you next that was like, oh, okay. I didn't even think of that. That's awesome. But, but I'm already doing it in my program, so it's super cool. Okay. 10 components to an essential, like, let me say that again. There are 10 essential components to an evidence-based writing practice. And I'll put them up here as we go through. Number one, writing is an essential part of the curriculum. Okay. Uh -huh. Number two, varied approaches to the teaching of writing that will lead to quality writing. So yes, varying your approaches. Don't do it the same every time. That makes sense. Okay, common sense. Number three, instruction focused on process element. Now I want to stop there for a second because when they're talking about process elements, they're talking about the pre-writing, brainstorming, drafting, all that, the posters that most of us have. And in one of the pieces of, uh, research that I read from Appleby from a long time ago, he was saying that just process-based instruction is not enough. It's not going to produce the, the results that you want. So if, if we're only zooming the posters, oh, you're here, here, and here, you finished, you're done, you turn it in, that just focuses on like too much on like a, a teacher led very heavy handed way that a teacher would walk a student through the writing process so they do need to be taught the process but notice that it's only one component out of 10 components and it's component three now let's move on to component four which says instruction focused on product elements that's like the essay so these things that we're doing right now that are super focused on the Common Core standards, which are great, we have to do them, I and we need to have a Common Core standards. We need to have the same instruction level from state to state to state. But if we just focus on that, that's only product. It is part of it, but it's one of 10. 
benefits, not all of them. Number five, utilizing technology in writing instruction. Done. Love it. Thank you, Google Docs. So much there. Number six, effective assessment and feedback for writing. It talks about rubrics. It talks about like students evaluating their own work. I need to kind of double down into that a little bit more this next year, I think. I haven't done enough of that. Number seven, instruction focused on writing skills. So it's saying you got to have a direct instruction, which I do in my um, short mini lesson. Number eight, that you learn through your writing. So if you're doing history and science or whatever, you just sort of explore ideas by writing through them. That makes sense. Got it. Number nine, promoting independent and reflective writers. Independent. <laughs> and so in this one, teacher modeling, um, it just kind of talks about them like having more discussion about it so that they're a little bit more like, oh, this is good. This is not good. I, I love that. 10, number 10, promoting a supportive writing environment. It talks about authentic writing tasks, modeling, having peer conferencing, having collaborative activities, giving praise for their effort, uh, adapting to writing environments, task materials, blah, blah, blah. So I do a lot of that in my, in my program is like, how do we make this environment a place that our students want to be and where they can see themselves as writers. There's one other report that I want to share with you from the Hetchinger Report, which is just this nonprofit that talks about education topics. And they came up with three things I want to share with you. One of them was like super cool. I'm really excited. Okay, let me show you a couple articles that came out from the Hetchinger Report, which is a nonprofit organization that reports on education topics. Here's the first one. Yeah, this is not shocking. Scientific evidence on how to teach writing is slim. So I went through here and I marked up a few things that I want to point out to you. Very clearly, there's remarkably very little high quality evidence of what works in writing, which leaves us like in a bad spot. And most studies on writing instruction didn't have control groups like I talked about. We're trying to figure out which one is better than the other. It's really hard to do that with young students. And figuring out, because it's so subjective, which approach is actually, how are we actually grading this in a way that is systematic, that's standardized across all situations. So here it talks about that there's some popular writing programs like Writer's Workshop or the Hoffman Method, which is the writing revolution. So I, I like that book too. And I like Lucy's first book, The Art of Teaching Writing. They both do great things. But notice how these are like two of the biggest ones going on out there. There are no controlled studies of their effectiveness right now. There's nothing out there. And then in here, it talks about this preliminary report, which came out in 2019. And then when you click on it, it says page not found. So I don't really know. So we'll, we'll know soon. And then it talks in here about some of the, right here, some of the approaches focused on explicitly teaching the writing process from planning to drafting and revising. That was one. Another one focused on emphasizing working with their classmates, making writing a communal activity. And then another approach, they integrated their reading with their writing. And so this is interesting. Some of them work, some of them time. None of them clearly outshone the other. So there's not one way more than any other that is working here. It does say here, I want to point out some stuff. Students benefit from step-by-step guides to writing, which is something that I create. I, I do these student guides so it walks them through the six skills that I teach them. That way they can always have it. Even if they're absent or something from school, I can send home those student guides so they can still go through it at their own rate. And then students need explicit grammar, but only in the context of their writing and not as a separate standalone lesson. And then now, look at this part. Beyond a well-structured writing course, Slavin and his colleagues noted that in these studies of writing, these classes were exciting, social, and noisy. So these are the ones that were getting good results. And look at this line right here. Motivation seems to be the key. I love it. If students love to write because their peers as well as their teachers are eager to see what they have to say, 
then they will write with energy and pleasure. And that's a huge part of my program. This is what was missing. And this is what they're saying out loud is that we need this. Now, there's another article. I'll just quickly show you what they came up with and why I have, I have this one unhappy face here. Let me show you this. There's this one line here that I kind of take issue with. It says, Graham's research of the research, sorry, Graham's review of the research doesn't resolve the age-old debate of whether students learn writing best naturally just by doing it or through explicit writing instruction. I think that's the problem that we've gotten ourselves in is that different organizations and research institutes have created this as a debate, like, oh, it's either this or that. But that's what happened with the reading programs. We swung the pendulum way too far. But we as teachers, we know that's not how it works. We know the middle is where we need to be. We need to scoop up as many students as we possibly can with a plethora of strategies and things that we're like, throwing a million plates in the air, I get it. It's really hard, but it's not just this or just that. I just don't like that line of this age old debate. Like, no, we're not debating. Anyway, here are the three things that they came up with, which were unequivocal in the research, things that were working in writing programs. Kind of surprising that these are the three that they picked. So look at this. Number one, spend more time writing. That's not, that's not surprising. This is obvious. I mean, they have to be writing more and consistently. Number two, watch this. Scroll down here, blah, blah, blah. Write on a computer. Okay. Seems sort of obvious, but it, it's talking more about the editing process, the revision process, that we're getting more results from our students when we use a computer. I agree. But number three, I want to point something out. Grammar instruction doesn't work. Hmm. So what they saw was that writing quality actually deteriorated. That's crazy. Their writing went down when they were where they were explicitly taught the grammar. So they did see though, look at this. Three studies did show that teaching kids how to combine two simple sentences into a single complex sentence was beneficial. Yay. This is actually what I do in my warm-ups. So this is the first thing that they do every morning. Combined sentences, combined sentences. They've been doing it for six months, and that's how long I've been sticking with this because that's how long it takes. At the beginning of the year, I'd say two or three of my kids could combine sentences into a compound or complex sentence. Now we're at 95%, and it took that long. And it's huge because they can feel what it, what it feels like to write a complex sentence or compound sentence, and they know how to punctuate it. They know the rhythm of it they're used to it they can they're integrating it into their writing now and it takes a long time <laughs> so i'm going to go into more detail about that in another video about how to get your warm-ups and teaching grammar through that and through sentence combining huge and now i want to go over one more thing that i discovered from mel robbins and what she said in a video that i think she said just for me okay so that was a lot of information and what do we take away from all of this. I want to go back to what I was saying about something that Mel Robbins said. A while ago, when I was deciding what to do with this information I had about this writer's program that I created, and I had all these ideas. I wasn't sure if I should make a book about it, if I should do a blog, what am I going to do? I'll just wait and kind of see. But then I came across this video from Mel Robbins. Look around. And she said this one line that kind of changed everything for me. And she said, stop waiting for someone to come and pick you. Nobody's coming to pick you. So if I stay here in my cozy little office and I don't reach out and share with you what I've learned, what my experiences are, we're just going to keep waiting and we're not going to get the evidence that we need to move forward with writing instruction. What we've learned from this is that even the programs that we are using right now, they don't have the research to back it up quite yet. Hopefully they'll get there. So in the meantime, I have found that we need to stop waiting for someone to tell us, for someone to come and say, here, here's what you do. That's the idea that you should do. We need to go forward. We need to take the evidence that we have in our own classrooms. And hopefully you're in a situation where your administration will support you so that you can do the practices that make sense for your kids. And now we're seeing that we kind of have a, that one out, 
Now we're seeing that we have a plethora of like, oh, there's all these different components to a writing and program that are super important, not just the essays, not just process, not just product. It has to do mainly with motivation and it has to do with their environment. And then it has to do with doing things in context with their grammar so that they can grow their skills through that sentence combining. And then how do they reflect? I mean, there's so many parts to this and it's difficult. I do get that. But hopefully you've taken something from this and maybe it made your brain kind of scramble and get a little bit flustered, <laughs> but it's okay. <laughs> um, I will help if any way I can, I will help to kind of like distill all this down into a simple way to attack all of this in your classroom. If you are interested in the type of program that I run, look below. I have a link to the introduction to my ebook. You can see the six skills that I teach on repeat in my writer's workshop. We do it over and over again so that they learn these skills, they master them, and then they can apply them to all their different types of writing that they do. They come to their essays already prepared with hooks and sentence complexity. We don't have to go over all that stuff. I just use my essay time that I do a block for that. I teach them the components of that essay. We work on a deadline, which is a skill they need to know. Not a nine-week deadline, do a 10-day deadline. And so they get things done quickly and efficiently. So check below if you'd like the link to that. And I appreciate you guys for stopping by. Please leave your comments. What do you think? Is this overwhelming or does this make you feel better? Hopefully it'll make you feel better. I, I'm feeling like we're going to get on the right track here, but we can't, we can't wait to be picked. We have to move forward and do this. Thanks. I'll see you guys next time. Mm -hmm.